I remember my mother telling me, um, well, you don't know what you're going to do with your life. You don't have a calling. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, I actually kind of do. It's not to be a doctor or a minister or something like that. It's to go and build stuff out of wood. And she just didn't, couldn't equate those things. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Pro Talk Podcast, our regular discussion with building industry professionals. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Andy Engel, former Fine Home Building Editor and now Carpenter. You can find the Fine Home Building Pro Talk Podcast and the original Fine Home Building Podcast at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. You can leave feedback and ask questions there too. Andy, thank you so much for being on with me today, buddy. Oh, it's my pleasure, Patrick. I haven't seen you since, well, like March. In normal times, we would have been together drinking at least half a dozen times by now, I would estimate. <laughs> yeah, probably so. I miss those days. <laughs> so are you still getting beer at Bad Dog Brewing up there in uh, New Milford? No, they're, uh, they, they're closed. Um, you can't even buy curbside pickup there. That's so. too bad. It is. I hope they reopen, but uh, who knows? So the place in uh, Newtown, Reverie Brewing, is still doing, uh, you know, curbside pickup, and I can buy it at the local beer store. So I'm going to buy some of those and drop them off at your place. Okay. I'll be there. How are you guys all doing? We're doing fine. Um, you know, in, in many ways, we're hermits anyway. Um, most of my work is right here in town. And the homeowners we're currently working for are in France for the foreseeable future. So it's just my partner, Brent, and me. Uh, we've been seeing each other every day since before the quarantine started. So we kind of figure if either one of us had it, the other one already had it by now anyway. Um, so it really hasn't affected our lives in a, a great way. What about uh, your boys? What about Duncan and... Uh... Duncan um, is, he works from home. He buys and sells minerals and gems, and it's all internet sales and mail pickup. So it's hardly affected him at all. What about um, Kevin? Kevin um, quit his job about, oh, three or four days before the lockdown. And he, <laughs> he had some interviews right away and then nothing. So uh, it's great to have him around the house because he mows the lawn and takes care of stuff like that. Yep. Um, and I'll miss him when he goes back to work. In fact, he's coming to work with me today because we need a hole dug. <laughs> that poor kid, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are disadvantages to living at home when you're 26. <laughs> Especially with a dad who's you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wouldn't add the age restriction. The same <laughs> disadvantages have applied since they were eight. So uh, of all the people I know who are carpenters, I think you've probably been a carpenter the longest. What got you into it and uh, who who introduced you to it? Tell me about that scenario. You know, I've always loved carpentry. Uh, my dad built the house that I grew up in. It was an ongoing project. Um, I remember being in third grade and this load of lumber showing up on a Friday, uh, thinking, oh, this is so cool. I'm going to get to help dad do something. And uh, they sent me to my friend's house on Saturday and sent me to Sunday school on Sunday, which I had never gone to Sunday school before. So now I know they just wanted me to get out of my dad's hair so we could get something done. <laughs> <laughs> but I was so disappointed. I bet. Um, but, yeah. But I've been playing around with woodworking literally since I was probably in third or fourth grade. Um, I read the Foxfire books uh, probably from sixth or seventh grade on. Um, made a banjo, made a dulcimer, things like that. As soon as fine woodworking came out, this is how old I am. I have issue one of fine woodworking that I actually subscribe to. Um, fine home building came out. Um, I started subscribing to that. By then... Uh, I was working uh, as a woodworker. Um, I'd gone to college for one year uh, because the idea of me becoming a carpenter for a living did not fly well with my mother. We had some knockdown, drag out battles with that. I had to go to college. I went to college for one year at Rutgers and majored in um, alcohol abuse. And uh, <laughs> they told me 
in no uncertain terms, they didn't want me back. Um, so that kind of settled that uh, issue. And uh, I went to work uh, as a carpenter. That first summer, I uh, wasn't really working as a carpenter. I was scraping lead paint off the side of a uh, Victorian house all summer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, of that course, explains a lot, buddy. It does, because <laughs> PPE, what's that? <laughs> um, and then I saw an ad in the newspaper, Woodworker Wanted, and I thought, well, all right, uh, maybe I can do that. And called up. They told me to come down for an interview, checked to see if I could read a tape measure, and hired me the next day. And that was at the Warren Lumber Door Shop in Washington, New Jersey. And uh, my boss was this old German fellow named Warner Thiel who had um, been trained as a cabinet maker in pre-war Germany. Uh, he was a great mentor. Uh, and that was really my introduction to professional carpentry. I worked in the door shop, uh, pre-hanging doors, doing custom mill work for three years. And then uh, in the you know, building boom of the early 80s, I went out on my own uh, and uh, became a self-employed carpenter. Uh, I stayed a self-employed carpenter and builder until 1996 when Kevin Ireton hired me at Fine Home Building as an assistant editor for about half of what I'd been making as a, a builder. Yeah. Um, but I, that was one of the best decisions I ever made. I'm, I'm going to hold off on the talking about the fine home building part a little bit, but how, were you successful as a builder? Were you making money? Did you feel like you were doing a good job? You know... I was making money. I was making pretty good money. Um, I wasn't happy with the partnership that I was in because it limited me to looking at building mostly as a financial uh, uh, thing. And I really wanted to be doing higher quality, higher end work than what we were doing. In the part of New Jersey I was in, though, the, there just wasn't a market for that. Everything we built was vinyl sided, um, and that's that was just the reality of the place. Um, so, you know, there were parts of what I did that I really enjoyed. Uh, the business aspect of it was not something that uh, appealed to me that much, and never has been. I really like being hands on. You know, in that time frame, I'm sure you weathered several uh, ups and downs of the economy. And, you know, anyone who's been mm -hmm. in this business for any period of time knows that this is a very cyclical boom or bust kind of type business. How did yep. you weather those those downturns? Um, it wasn't always easy. Uh, there were there were some times when money was very tight, um, but I would take on anything. Uh, I didn't say no to to work. And when times were good, I was literally working 80 hours a week. Um, and that enabled my wife to stay home with the kids, which was a good thing. Um, Except you never saw them. No, no, that's true. I mean, I, I literally, there were times when I would come home from work in the wintertime, been out in the cold all day. You hit that warm house when you come home from having work outside and you just want to fall asleep. I would have mm -hmm. dinner and I'd sit down on the couch to read my then three or four year old son Duncan, uh, a bedtime story, and I, I would fall asleep. I remember him trying to wake me up. Daddy, <laughs> say the words. <laughs> That's tragic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Man, yeah. So those. Go ahead. I, I wasn't going to say anything important. Go ahead. I was going to say so. So you're you're back at it again. Um, talk mm -hmm. about your your relationship. You have a you have a partner again, an, an informal partnership. Um, it's you know it is informal. Um, and but we work together all the time. Uh, a friend uh, I've known for many years, Brent Benner. His wife was a former editor at Fine Gardening, which is how I got to know them. Uh, and Brent and I had worked together on a few jobs fifteen years ago, and. It, he was one of the few guys I've ever worked with where we're on the job and it feels like we share the same brain. Uh, one or the other of us will be thinking, okay, I need this tool. And the other guy's standing there with it in his hand. Uh, and it's, we just, we're, there's a real uh, symbiosis between how we work. How do you guys divide the, the labor? I mean, neither of you are uh, spring chickens, shall we say. Um, <laughs> how, how do you uh, make that work? Well, I, you know, I'm 15 years older than Brent, uh, but he's still in his 40s. Um, but he, he kind of watches out for me, actually, especially since this time um, when I started with Brent back in 
late January, I had an ACL replacement surgery on my left knee in uh, November. So I was still limping around a little bit, out of shape from having been sitting around with my leg elevated while things healed. Um, so he, uh, he kept an eye on me, but uh, it's come back. Uh, a couple of months of wearing the tool belt and climbing up and down ladders. Uh, I'm back in probably better physical shape than I was in, in high school. Uh, partly to riding my bike again, that helps a lot. Um, so the first few months back in the saddle really hurt. Uh, I was tired at the end of the day. I'd come home, I'd want to fall asleep. Um, and now uh, I come home from work, I get on my bike and I go ride for a couple of hours. So how many calories do you have to eat now, Andy? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I mean, a, a two hour bike ride is going to be 1500 calories. Um, so how many do I have to eat in a day? I don't know. I do still have salads for lunch. Um, and I've gone from 205 pounds to 190 pounds uh, in a couple of months I've been working with Brent. Uh, so it's, you have to consume a lot of calories. I bet. And I bet you have better muscle tone, which would make you, you know, your weight loss, uh, disp- you know, yeah, less, less than you would imagine. Yeah, it's it's true. But yeah, things are getting easier. I I would say, um, you know, at my age, a lot of a lot of people are not in good shape. And my doctor's always happy to see me. (laughs) What do you think the the biggest changes in as you know, in regard to the trade have what what are the what are the biggest changes that occurred for carpenters in the four decades you've been doing this? You know, it's become a lot more technical. Um, Back when I started, you know, we were we were barely using nail guns. The first house I ever trimmed on my own, I used a hammer and a nail set. Um, and I said, Can you imagine yeah. doing that today? No, no. Uh, I wouldn't even trim a window uh, <laughs> <laughs> without a nail gun today. Um, but, you know, so the tools have changed dramatically. Uh, we're using nail guns for everything. Um, impact drivers were a huge change because we – the things we screw together today, it's amazing. Um, even before that was just the cordless drill. I remember buying a Makita 7.2 volt cordless drill in probably 1986 and thinking it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, and I couldn't kill that thing. That lasted forever until I dropped it into a cellar full of water and I decided <laughs> not to recover it. <laughs> um but also the materials have changed drastically. Uh, you know, probably started with uh, house wrap, Tyvek being you know, what I think of as the original. Um, and you know, that had been, we'd been using tar paper and then we got this Tyvek stuff that we thought was um, invincible. Uh, you, you couldn't do anything wrong with it. It was almost magical. So we'd run it over the whole house and slash a big X over the windows and just fold it back in. And yeah, we did a great thing. Um, now, of course, we know that there are a few more steps that you have to do to flash a window and keep it from leaking. Um, but again, that has been a, a change, a uh, gradual change. In 2005, I left fine home building, went out on my own for a few years, uh, and I was putting windows in a house, eagle windows, and uh, the salesman stopped by just to see how the job was going. And he saw that we were flashing the windows. He ran back to his car and got his camera, and he said it was the first time he'd ever seen anybody do it right. And that was only 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, I still and, hardly ever see people do it right. Yeah. Uh, but the materials have gotten better. Uh, you know, the zip sheathing, the Advantech flooring, um, that has definitely eased things. Uh, the flashing materials that we have today, uh, the thin self-adhering membranes, the flexible ones, they're just incredible. Um, and the attention that we pay to things like air sealing. Uh, again, when I started, no one really knew what that meant. Uh, and then it kind of became um, adapted as more like fire blocking, fire stopping. And my insulation contractor would come in and stuff fiberglass into the holes in the framing, which, you know, we know today is worthless. But um, then probably by the early 1990s, we were starting to use spray foam around those holes. Um, or uh, uh, intumescent caulk, which was a real pain in the neck to work with, and they were like that stuff. Why? Um, 
because it would dry up and fall out. And I thought it was, you know, <laughs> that's not those... what you want in a sealant. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it was one of those things that made you feel like you were doing a good job, but actually didn't do anything. Um, and... I think that about my work all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I think the, uh, oh, my, then my first foam gun, there was a revelation. Um, going from cans of foam to using a, you know, a Pajaris foam gun. Uh, whoa, you can actually stop this stuff from coming out of the end. That's, this is pretty cool. Um, but you know, things have gotten better. We were paying better attention to insulation. Um, we, at least up here in Connecticut, we're in a pretty high end market and people, most of the tradesmen I work with are pretty aware of, um, the changes and have kept up with technology, um, and are doing things pretty right. Not always, what about, but what, what about the inspection process? You know, are you and Brent living that in Roxbury or is that not an issue? Uh, in Roxbury, it's a non-issue. It's a very small town. Um, and you know, literally both of us are residents of this town. Um, I'm, I'm actually on one of the land use boards in town and we know the inspectors very well. We have one inspector. He's in town two days a week and he knows the kind of work we do. Um, and we, we talk about things beforehand. If we have any questions, we go to him. We have a very good relationship. And, um, so he comes out when we need him, um, uh, or he'll say to take photos. Um, but again, we're, he knows we're going to go above code anyway. So we're not the people he's worried about. Mm -hmm. What do you think the biggest, uh, challenges facing contractors and carpenters specifically are now? Um, well, there are, in the broader term, um, it's a labor issue. It's very hard to get, um, good help. Uh, it's very hard to get help at all. Um, and I've heard a lot of, uh, uh, I've heard millennials dissed a lot, uh, but in the job I had before this working for, uh, Hudson Valley Preservation, we had two guys who were millennials and they were fantastic to work with. Their work ethic was just unbeatable. Um, you know, maybe my only complaint with them is that they did value their personal time more than my generation does. So if it was a nice Friday, um, well, well, might go skiing, might go surfing. We're not coming to work. No. I'd say um, they're smarter than us, dude. <laughs> I, I know that now, but my 25-year-old self would have been, uh, there's no way that I would have done that. Yeah. Uh, it just, just wouldn't have happened. But when they were there, you know, you think of young people being on their phones all the time. No, these guys were not. They put on the tool belts, the phones went away. And they worked hard. Um, but I think they may have been rare. Uh, they weren't easy to find. Um, and keeping them there is is a hard thing. Um, I think that a lot of, I think for years, for generations, and I, I experienced this with my own mother, um, going into the trades was discouraged. Uh, if you became a tradesman, you were a lower class person. And... Um, I don't buy that for a minute, but it, it's been an uphill fight. Um, and uh, I think that has discouraged a lot of smart and capable people um, who maybe would have liked to have gone in the trades. Um, I went into the trades because it's what it, it called me. Um, I remember my mother telling me, um, well, you don't know what you're going to do with your life. You don't have a calling. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, I actually kind of do. It's not to be a doctor or a minister or something like that. It's to go and build stuff out of wood. Mm -hmm. And she just didn't, couldn't equate those things, um, whereas I can. And I, I hope that uh, Keep Craft Alive uh, and some more movements uh, is making a difference. Uh, I don't know if it is, though. How, how do you think we should be attracting smart young people to the, to the trades? I think that we're making good efforts. I think, like I said, um, keep craft alive is a good effort. How do you get that message out to the young people? Uh, I think the platform is important. You know, they're looking at Reddit. They're looking at, uh, I don't even know if they're looking at Twitter. They're looking at Instagram. You kind of have to keep up with the social media platforms that the young people are, uh, using and you have to make it 
look cool and appealing. Um, and that's hard to do in an age where everybody who's cool is sitting on a smartphone or a tablet and doing whatever it is they do. Whereas we're out there <laughs> uh, in the doing field stuff. Actually, actually building <laughs> stuff. The building that you're sitting in, somebody had to build that. It's a hard one because it's a societal question. It's not uh, one of, um, you know, how do you convince an individual? It's how do you convince uh, society that this is a good way to, uh, this is a good thing to do with your life. I, I think it's got to be money for what that's worth and yeah. some um, recognition of the importance of the jobs, right? I agree with that. And, you know, money is key. It, it took me a long time to be able to make a decent living as Carpenter. Um, you know, coming in, uh, you know, the fact is that the the market is only going to pay so much. And until uh, customers are, understand the difference between quality construction and poor construction and understand that quality construction costs money, then... I don't know how you're going to get there. Yeah. You know, and we're lucky again where we are. We're in a high-end market. We have um, probably a third of the houses in the town where I live are second homes uh, owned by typically New Yorkers. Uh, right now, because of COVID, they're all here. I uh, can't believe how much traffic there is in Roxbury, more than there I've ever seen. Um, but uh, that's an exception. Um I'm not sure how it would go if I were still in the part of New Jersey where I grew up. Yeah. Amen. You recently started managing uh, Fine Home Buildings Ask the Experts Department. Mm -hmm. um, what's that like to be back in the magazine business? And uh, what, what are the challenges in answering reader questions? Um, I always loved doing Ask the Experts. Last time I was at Fine Home Building, that was the department that I did. And it's kind of my favorite one because you... You do interact directly with the readers, um, which was always one of the best parts of the job. Uh, you know, somebody would call up the magazine and somebody would actually answer the phone. And, <laughs> and you know, you made, you made a fan for life just by uh, treating people like you'd want to be treated yourself. Um, so I love that part of it. And for me, the biggest issue right now is finding time. I've had to be disciplined about finding time to... Uh, take care of my writing and editing uh, side gigs. And so, you know, between 6 and 7.30 in the morning, I set aside every day as my my writing, writing and time. editing time. Um, and that seems to work very well. Um, answering readers' questions is fun. Uh, I haven't answered that many of them myself. I've uh, farmed a lot, most of them out to um, experts, which I, I enjoy because, again, it puts me back in contact with people I used to work with. Uh, it gives me an opportunity to talk to people like John Carroll or Mike Curtin. Um, and, again, that those guys were also great parts of the job uh, as an editor in general. Um, the authors at Fine Home Building tend to be just fun, knowledgeable, intelligent people. Uh, and going out on the photo shoots and getting to know them, getting to see a slice of their lives – uh, that was a great part of the job too. So uh, I'm getting getting to experience a lot of the really good parts of the job uh, without having to sit in an office all day. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 um, you're also doing a blog post for Green Building Advisor. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, I'm doing a post every two weeks, um, which is harder than it sounds. Um, first off, Green Building Advisor is a very savvy audience. Uh, these people eat green building for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, and honestly, most of them know more about it than I do. So it, I have to spend some time on that. I have to um, work at it. I have to educate myself. Um, and so it's been good in that regard. It's forced me to be a little more disciplined um, than I would have been otherwise. Uh, to come up with good material and to write material that isn't going to be torn apart by people who know more than I do. <laughs> um, I just did a really fun one uh, with uh, my former colleague at, the, at my last job, Ian Schwant, uh, who uh, we both left uh, the company at about the same time. And he went back to Wisconsin where he grew up uh, and he's going to be building a high performance home on a corner of his family farm. And 
Ian's a very thoughtful, analytical guy. And he came up with uh, a way of looking at several different iterations of high performance walls, double stud walls, uh, two by six walls with foam on the outside. You know, it probably had half a dozen different options that he was considering. And he took a sample wall size of eight foot by 12 foot, just to have something to start with. You can figure the material cost on something like that pretty easily. But the, the question, the thing that's hard to nail down is the labor costs on that. Um, and he thought about that from a carpenter's perspective. If I were building this wall, which one is going to be more complicated? And using just a standard single two by six stud wall with a uh, plywood or OSB sheathing as his baseline, uh, gave that a number of one. Uh, and anything that made it more complicated uh, raised the multiplier. And um, I thought it was a very clever system. And that's what my. Uh, uh, next blog post on GBA is about. Ian and I went back and forth with a series of emails and explained his thinking and um, how he arrived at his conclusions and, you know, subscribe to GBA and you'll be able to read that. You're killing me, dude. I want to know the uh, outcome here. <laughs> I can send it to you. <laughs> I think you would love it. It's, it's geeky enough. It would oh, really man. appeal to you. So uh, Ian's, uh, one thing you forgot to mention about Ian is he has uh, the most acerbic and hilarious sense of humor that I have ever experienced. I, I uh -huh. just greatly enjoy spending time with him because I, yep. I can't stop laughing. I uh, couldn't agree more. I really miss working with Ian on a day-to-day -day basis. And, uh, <laughs> um, you know, our, our, when I, I opened that blog post by saying something along the lines of, when I started that job, I was a little worried about meeting the other lead carpenter because I thought, ah, I hope this guy doesn't think I'm stepping on his toes. And uh, turned out he was absolutely wonderful to work with. And uh, I said something along the lines of uh, the time we spent uh, hanging or swinging hammers together uh, was great. But the time we spent bellying up to the bar together was even better. <laughs> <laughs> We have to make a road trip out there to Wisconsin to see his project, man. I would love that. That would be cool. Yeah. So uh, I ask everyone on the who who's on the Pro Talk podcast about their own home. Uh, mm -hmm. So can you tell me briefly about your place and, and do you want to work on it? Do you like that part of it? What's it like now that you have to be a carpenter nine to five? Well, I don't want to pay anyone else to work on it. Um, <laughs> because guys up here are expensive. Good health yes. is not cheap. I always say I would, I, I would never hire anyone I could afford. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of like that. I mean, literally when I, when we built this house, uh, we started building in, uh, 1997. Um, and the only thing I didn't do myself was the excavation and, uh, well, I hired well. a framing done. But I ended up having to reframe a lot of it because I, uh, uh, I hired the siding done. It was probably the first house in Connecticut to use uh, hardy plank because mm. uh, I couldn't buy it in Connecticut. I had to go to New Jersey to find it. Really? And, yeah, uh, the, uh, the carpenter who was putting up the siding got about two-thirds of the way done and walked off the job. Left his <laughs> scaffolding. <laughs> Never saw him again. Um, so I ended up – I still had the scaffolding uh, 20 years later. Um, but I ended up finishing the hardy plank myself. Um, I didn't put the roof on, but everything else, uh, you know, I uh, wired it, I plumbed it, I um, trimmed it. Well, I haven't finished trimming it. If you see behind me, there's an untrimmed window. There we go. Um, <laughs> welcome to my life. Um, I did and you have a very patient wife, I should add. <laughs> I have the best wife in the world. Uh, that's for sure. Um, we did manage uh, to build a... Uh, uh, garage, which will never see a car except to be worked on. It's my wood shop. And above that, there's a, uh, an apartment, um, that, uh, we store the relatives in at Christmas time. Um, uh, and that is finished. Um, uh, and we're working on the, uh, on the house, uh, as we go, uh, right now it's summertime. So we're trying to do outdoor projects. I'm building a uh, stone retaining wall on the one side of my driveway, uh, that uh, we want to put a flower bed in there. Pat bought a whole bunch of plants from the fine gardening uh, sale recently. So I have a little bit of a uh, time push on that. I have to finish that in this week and get some dirt behind it and let her plant before the plants die on the porch in their containers. 
Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm also, um, uh, on rainy days, I'm working in my shop uh, cutting a timber frame for my woodshed because why wouldn't you timber frame a woodshed? There, there is right. no more complicated way to do it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but the, the genesis of that um, is that my neighbor several years ago had a whole pile of pressure treated six by sixes for some reason that he wasn't going to use. He said, Andy, do you want these? And I said, yes. And I hopped on my Kubota and drove over there and put them on the forks and took them home. And so I didn't have to buy a lot of the material. I had to buy some of the longer material, but it's all being made out of pressure treated six by six because it's available. And since it's an open structure, it's going to be open to the weather. It seems like having something rot resistant would be a good idea. And it's free. Um, and it's free. Well, <laughs> not the stuff I had to buy, not the 12 footers uh, that I had to buy for the, uh, the plates uh, and some of the girts. But uh, it's fun because I bought Will Beamer's uh, book, Learn to Timber Frame, which I reviewed for, the, for you. Um, Will Beamer is an old fine home building author. I did one of the, my first articles as an editor with him. Uh, and he used to run the Hartwood School up in Massachusetts, which was a timber framing school. Great guy. And if you have any interest in timber framing and learning how to do it, this book, it's almost, it, it could be a taunting book the way it's put together. Um, step by step, it's really well edited. Uh, the photos are fantastic. And Will has been timber framing for probably 50 years. He was one of the originals who got into that movement back in the early 1970s and the hippie days when um, there, I think we viewed home building uh, very differently, or at least some portion of the population did. Um, people built things on their own. Um, I remember the you know early, early days of fine home building when there were a lot of DIY articles uh, about people who were really immersed in the um, in the process. One of my favorites was in issue 14, and it was just this essay. It was a six or eight page essay. You would never publish it today uh, about a guy just writing about the trials and tribulations of building his own house. And had the I think the best line that was ever written in the magazine, um, where he said that he had. Uh, too much frozen snot in his beard and too little experience under his belt. And, <laughs> and you just loved that guy because he put his heart and soul into what he was doing. And I don't see a lot of people viewing their homes that way anymore. Um, I loved that about the early days of the magazine. Um, so to me, you know, building this house, working on this house is as much about the experience, more about the experience, really, than it is about the finished product. Um, and that's how building things has always been for me. Once I'm done with uh, trimming a house, building a piece of furniture, anything like that, I don't care if I ever see it again. It simply stops mattering to me. Um, I, I, I love doing the work. Uh, and the process is, is what drives me. Thank you so much for being on the show, man. It's been great talking with you. Likewise. I, I hope we can do it um, sometime soon in person. You know, come over. Yeah. I've got a big porch. We can sit six feet apart and wipe our, uh, wipe our beers down with uh, alcohol wipes before we share. <laughs> it sounds awesome, man. <laughs> Maybe we can get Ian in on that, too. Yeah, bring him back from Wisconsin. No, he's, <laughs> he's safely ensconced in a COVID-free zone, so he's not coming back. He left at just the right time, right? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. So thank well, you for having me. It's been fun. Uh, thanks, man, very much. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you, Andy, for joining us. Thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find the podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Thanks very much for listening. Happy building. Happy building.